A few years ago, I constructed a miniature Tesla Model S, which I named the Test Cart. Like its full-size counterparts and other electric vehicles, the Test Cart contains essential EV components such as a motor, controller, and a battery. However, one of Tesla's most iconic features is missing in the Test Cart. You probably guessed it, full self-driving capabilities. The idea of adding some kind of self-driving feature to the test cart had been on my mind for quite some time. However, as fun as this project sounded, I knew that it wouldn't be easy. I mean, it's no secret that self-driving technology is extremely complex. Through some of my initial research, I came across a course on Udemy titled The Complete Self-Driving Car Course. The course includes 18 hours of video with a variety of content such as computer vision, deep learning, and you even get to simulate a fully functional self-driving car. I just want to say that the creators of this course did an amazing job, and it taught me deep learning concepts that were essential in making this project successful. So I put a link to the course in the video description if you want to check it out. To make the test card autonomous, I'll be using a machine learning technique called behavioral cloning. Behavioral cloning is a method of machine learning where a model is trained to copy a specific behavior by showing it examples of that behavior. The aim is to make the model imitate the behavior of a human without needing to know why the human made certain decisions. The process of behavioral cloning typically involves three main steps, data collection, training, and evaluation. The course utilizes an open source self-driving car simulator by Udacity. The data collection is done by driving the car through the training track inside of the simulator. Images are taken at each moment of the drive, and these images represent the training dataset. The label for each image is the steering angle of the car at that specific moment. Once the data is collected, various image augmentation techniques are applied and the data is pre-processed. The images are then fed into a convolutional neural network. This neural network enables the model to learn how to drive autonomously. The main variable that the model will learn to adjust is the steering angle of the car at any given moment. The course makes use of the NVIDIA network architecture, which is highlighted in an article titled End-to-End -End Deep Learning for Self-Driving Cars. After completing the course, it was really rewarding to use the model with the simulator and see the car drive by itself. So now that I had an understanding of behavioral cloning, I knew that this was the approach that I wanted to take for making the test cart self-driving. However, I knew that a big challenge lied ahead, which would be translating what I've learned into a physical self-driving vehicle. So after much prototyping and brainstorming, I came up with a plan and got to work. Let me present to you, after countless hours of research, design, hard work, and failures, the test cart's all-new self-driving upgrade. Due to limited space, trying to fit all the components inside of the plastic body just wasn't going to happen, which is why I built the self-driving module over top of the body. The entire thing just bolts on, and the vehicle can be converted back to normal within minutes. The only modifications that I had to make to the original chassis was welding on some tabs for the module to secure onto, and replacing the original steering shaft with a keyed shaft. The frame of the self-driving module had to be exceptionally rigid to withstand the torque generated by the steering motor. So let me go over all the components and explain how they work together. The test cart is equipped with three Logitech C920 webcams. All three cameras are used during data collection and only the middle one is used when self-driving. It provides the necessary visual input for the model to analyze and make steering decisions. The motor is from a power wheelchair and let me tell you this was a project on its own. I mean, just look at how filthy this thing was when I bought it. It only cost me $40, which seemed like a great deal, but I soon regretted my decision. It didn't work upon testing, so I had to take it apart, turn the commutator on the lathe, 
replace the motor cables, get some new brushes, and replace the gearbox grease. Basically, an entire rebuild. The wheelchair motor functions as a giant servo motor, which is controlled by an Arduino and a Cytron DC motor driver. Position feedback is achieved through a potentiometer that rotates along with the motor shaft. To create the sprocket hub, I repurposed the original wheel hub. I turned it down on the lathe and attached an aluminum timing pulley to the back. The Arduino reads the potentiometer value and PWM signal and uses a PID controller to compute and provide the appropriate output. If you're interested in making your own custom servo, James Bruton and DroneBot Workshop both have excellent videos on this. This second Arduino is responsible for receiving the predicted steering angle data from Python through serial communication and converting it into a PWM signal to be sent to the first Arduino. It was important that I found a motor which would allow me to disengage the gearbox. Turning this lever disengages the motor shaft from the gearbox, allowing me to freely turn the steering wheel. Without this feature, I would have to build a mechanism to disengage the motor sprocket from the steering shaft, which could be difficult. This is crucial because the motor has a 24 to 1 gear ratio, making it extremely difficult to turn the steering wheel. So when I'm not using the self-driving feature, all that I have to do is turn this lever and I can drive the car normally. To power the steering motor, I'm using two lead-acid batteries connected in series, providing 24 volts. They're just held in place with some 3D printed brackets that I designed. The onboard laptop serves as the brains behind the operation and is used for recording data, training the model, and evaluating its performance. I found this laptop vehicle mount secondhand, and it's super sturdy and perfect for this application. I also made these additional brackets, which help prevent the screen from vibrating. So let's go teach this thing how to drive. There's a park not too far from my shop, which I've chosen as the designated testing location. It has a walking path that serves perfectly as a track. I knew that I would most likely have to make multiple visits during the experimentation phase, so finding a nearby and easily accessible location was crucial. The goal was to get the car to drive all the way around the path on its own. The first step was data collection. Earlier, I showed that the test cart was equipped with three cameras. Well, initially it only had one. For the initial data collection, I recorded approximately 10 laps in each direction. This resulted in a data set of over 48,000 images. And after feeding these images into the neural network, it was time for the first test. All right, so the model's trained and it's time for the very first test. All right, I need to fix this throttle problem, but oh, it's definitely not turning the right way. Something's not right here. Okay, something screwed up. Oh. Oh! Oh my goodness! Whoa! Whoa! It's like a roller coaster. All right, I don't know, I, that didn't work. The car would steer correctly once in a while, but most of the time it would just steer off of the path. This first test drive actually ended up being the best one that I would have for a while. The following days, I recorded multiple different data sets and trained many different models, but I was having no luck. Looking back on the self-driving course, three cameras were used for collecting data. A left camera, center camera, and right camera. This allows capturing three images, each with a slightly different viewpoint. It helps generalize the model by collecting more samples of the same scene and diversifying it, simulating the car being in different positions. So I decided to get two more cameras in hopes of getting better results. All right, so we're back for what feels like the hundredth time, and we've upgraded from one camera to three cameras. So let's see how it goes. The data collection code works by setting up a serial connection with the Arduino and opens the three cameras. Pressing the R key allows me to start and stop recording data. When recording is active, it saves the images and writes the file names and the Arduino data to a CSV file. After getting my new and improved data set of over 120,000 images, I was feeling confident. I headed back home to train some models and it was time for yet another test. All right, so. We're here again for test number, I've lost count, but let's see what happens. Oh. At 
this point, I was feeling pretty defeated. It seems like every time I went to the park, no progress was being made, and things were just getting worse. Although it wasn't until later that I realized I had made some changes in the code, which was causing the car to turn in the opposite direction than intended. Sometimes it's really easy to overlook the simple things. And this is when things finally started to work. <laughs> the self-driving code works by setting up a serial connection with the Arduino and loads the pre-trained model. It then captures video frames from the camera, pre-processes each frame, and then feeds it into the model to predict the steering angle. The steering angle is then mapped to a value between 0 and 255 and sent to the Arduino. The Arduino then takes this incoming value and sends it as a PWM signal to a second Arduino. The second Arduino reads the potentiometer value and PWM signal and uses a PID controller to compute and provide the appropriate output. That output is then transmitted as a PWM signal to the Cytron motor driver, which finally moves the steering shaft to the desired angle. The only areas of the path that the vehicle often gets confused is where the path branches off. I wanted the car to just continuously drive laps, but oh no! it always decides to take a wrong turn at these spots. <laughs> I could fix this by training a better model, but I've been to this park way too many times, and I want to finish this project. I forgot to mention that for all the tests, I either held this thumb throttle or used the potentiometer to control the speed. The steering reacts very quickly, and I can go really fast while having the vehicle steer itself with no problems. It's just a little scary knowing that the car can take a wrong turn at any given moment. All right, well, I hope that you all enjoyed this video, and thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Is that lame? <laughs>